so let's go straight to overview. We're dividing the class up into three sections. Uh, Genesis and Galatians lay a foundation for the uh, discussion of the rest of Paul's text in the New Testament and Peter's text in the New Testament. Uh, Genesis remarkably begins with a discussion that relates to male-female and, and gender relationship. Uh, if I were sort of writing the beginning of human history, I'm not sure I would have gone into that much detail on that issue. Uh, so it comes, it came to me at least as a little bit of a surprise. Uh, but it is referred to many times in the New Testament, New Testament uh, as a point of reference for the arguments that Paul and Peter make. So we want to take a look at that first. Genesis 1 through 5 is the literary unit. And then we'll have a short um, scan of the narrative material. Uh, you don't need to write on that, but I want to give us a little bit of feel about how women work in the Bible uh, throughout the narratives, Old and New Testament. <clears throat> and then come to Galatians. For egalitarians, that's probably their foundational text. Uh, Galatians 3.28, that in Christ there is neither male nor female. Uh, and then trying to parse that out as to exactly what that means. And then in comparison to that, Philemon in the first section of our class. So then you'll be writing just on the two key passages, but we'll be filling in with others. I want to be comprehensive in looking, by looking at every passage that might be important in the gender debate. Uh, I don't think we will miss one. So as comprehensive as possible. But Paul does speak in Galatians about Jew and Gentile. Matter of fact, that's his main point of writing the letter. Uh, and he also speaks on the side, along with male and female, about slave and free. So the letter to Philemon about slavery, or about him as a slave, and going back to his master, is an important application <clears throat> of a foundational principle Paul makes in Galatians. So we'll, we'll try to develop our way of interpreting by those kind of applications. And then family, married or single, uh, how we uh, relate to one another as men and women, Colossians, Peter, Titus are also in this group, but we'll be highlighting 1 Corinthians 7 and Ephesians 5. Uh, Ephesians 5 is usually where we go for this. How many have heard a wedding ceremony uh, where the pastor went to Ephesians 5 for the text? Anybody nod your head? Yeah. Uh, it, it's really quite common. 1 Corinthians 7 uh, for some reason, and I'm still not quite sure why, is not nearly so common. Even though it speaks of 12 different aspects of Christian marriage, compared to just two different aspects in Ephesians 5. Even though it's five times as long as the Ephesians 5 passage. So, to bring some balance, we will try <clears throat> to bring in the, the two texts that I think might be more representative of the two positions, so you can hear both sides from the scripture. And then finally, uh, uh, we'll come to the 1 Corinthians 11 text, which touches a little bit on the relationship between the Father and the Son, God the Father and God the Son, and how that might relate to gender relations. And then the 1 Timothy 2 text, which is without question the most commonly cited text with regard to church ministry. Uh, both of them more complex texts. We'll come to those and talk about issues of ministry in that context. Okay, overview. Resources first of all. Blackboard has a wealth of resources for you. Uh, click through the folders, the egalitarian, the complementarian folders. Uh, there's a folder that has my name on of things that I have uh, written on the subject apart from my work in DBE. Uh, there are folders with just sort of general information under course resources. Take some time and browse through Blackboard. <clears throat> but there are two other websites that have now become the standard bearers for the two sides of the gender debate. Uh, the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, start on the right side here, uh, and 
Christians for Biblical Equality, CBE and CBMW. Uh, these were both formed around 1987 uh, in the wake of the Evangelical Theological Society meeting that addressed male and female in biblical perspective, was the full title of the meeting in the mid-80s. Uh, a huge national debate, highly spirited, to uh, put it euphemistically, uh, and it led to the sort of division, the entrenchment, division into two different societies of evangelicals over the gender debate. And these two societies remain uh, the uh, two voices. Uh, on the CBE side, uh, Mimi Haddad is uh, president now. Catherine Clark Crager was the founder of it. She has now passed on to be with the Lord. Uh, but uh, sadly, uh, Mimi had to leave just yesterday. She was visiting here from Minnesota uh, and was uh, hanging out on campus and would have been happy to come and say hello to the class. But she had to leave yesterday to head back home. She and her husband, Dale. Uh, Phil Payne, uh, another textbook. Uh, Phil Payne is probably the most comprehensive and I would say the most sought after speaker, scholar speaker from an egalitarian perspective today. Uh, different persons have filled that role or several persons sometimes. Uh, but Phil Payne with his uh, new book, just a couple years old now, Man and Woman, One in Christ. Uh, which focuses exclusively on the Pauline material in the New Testament, referencing Genesis sort of as Paul references Genesis, but not dealing with that specifically. About 500 pages, about the size of the textbooks that you're using in the class here. Uh, so it's another comprehensive text, and, and it sets beside very nicely the, uh, again, the single authored text by the familiar Wayne Grudem, uh, evangelical feminism and biblical truth. You kind of get a feel for the tone of that book from the title. Yeah, it, it is uh, a response to a position and with the suggestion that biblical truth might not be part of evangelical feminism. Uh, <clears throat> Wayne used to be the uh, president of uh, CBMW. That's been passed on to several different persons now. Newly elected, I had to update my slides this week, newly elected, now Owen Strawn, that's pronounced Strawn uh, somehow, <clears throat> is uh, the spokesperson for the CBMW movement. But in, in reality, and that this has now been the case th since 87, in reality, Wayne Grudem has been the anointed prophet of the movement. By, by, by the, the people within the movement. He is the one that they look to, and, and even with Owen's appointment just this past week, uh, when it was announced, there was a long paragraph of introduction by Wayne Grudem, saying, yes, he's my boy, he can, he can do this, you know, you ought, to, you ought to support him. So Wayne Grudem continues to be a very strong and important voice. Uh, he served as an editor of uh, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, wrote a couple things within that, uh, but I don't know of any voice since the inception of the Complementarian Movement in 1987 that has been as important as uh, the voice of Wayne Grudem. So I, I am assuming again that you have already read a good bit of Wayne Grudem. Uh, and uh, what you read in RBMW will not always be by Wayne Grudem. Matter of fact, mostly it'll be by other persons. So it will be some variety there but I wanted to make that clear. So we have the official leaders of the two positions, of the two movements, and then we have the persons who currently are the primary spokespersons. So this, this picture and book has changed several times. Uh, this one, the picture has changed <laughs> as he's grown older, but, uh, and, and the book has changed a little bit, but Wayne Grudem's always been the, the primary spokesperson there. Okay, chart for you here. <clears throat> and th this will give us the big picture. Let me just start this around on both sides. I normally don't bring the printout of the chart. I'm kind of ecologically minded here, and so less paper is better. But for the first day of class, I thought it might be helpful that everyone had something to sort of jot a note on with regard to the chart. <clears throat> 
as soon as it gets all the way around, I, I want us to walk through it fairly carefully because it is the big picture of where we're going this semester. Uh, everything sort of is understood within this context. So, so let's, let's start at the center of it. Yeah, it looks like they're making it to the back. Uh, non-traditional evangelical views. And you might be thinking right off, oh, wait a minute, I thought complementarity was the traditional view. Well, patriarchy is a traditional view. Patriarchy has been around since the fall. So since God said Adam would rule over Eve, we have ruler, male rulership, patriarchy, father rule, patriarchy. <clears throat> but in the 1980s, as a matter of fact, it started a little bit earlier with George Knight's work in the late 1950s, but officially, and this is according to Wayne Grudem, officially the coin, uh, the term was coined complementarity or complementarianism, complementarian, was coined in 1987 when CBMW was founded. And so there is a retention in this position of male leadership, an exclusive male leadership. Men are the senior leaders, women are not. Uh, in, in a marriage, the, the husband is the leader, the wife is not. Uh, an exclusive male leadership, but with an important change from the traditions of human history and church history in particular, uh, an important change in that they argued that men and women were equal now in status, equal in being. No inferiority, superiority, we are absolutely equal in being. One of my complementarian friends told me that he could just as well use the term egalitarian as I could. Uh, because he believes in equality, in gender equality, because men, men and women are equal in Christ in being, but not in function. Up until the 1980s, the traditional position was that men and women were not equal in either of those things, being or function. Now, the tricky part is that <clears throat> they are not equal in function because, women, they, they are not equal in function because of their being. But they are equal in being. Let that sink in for a second. Gets a little tricky. They're equal in being. Men and women are equal in being. But because of who the woman is, because of her being, she's not equal in function. You can see the, the slight tension in thought there. Now, I don't mean to, be, to criticize it by saying that, but just to point out, that's the kind of thing that needs to be explained. Because it seems that if the, per, if the uh, foundation of, of not being equal is being, then you're probably not equal in being. We're going to talk about that. But understand that a change was made, radically unequal, Differences exploited. Men were superior to women. That is the view of human history, for good or for bad. That, that's where we have come from for millennia. But in the most recent time, in the last 50 years, and, and technically in the last 30 years, there has arisen a view called complementarianism. Uh, I, I'm using it more descriptively here as complementary patriarchy. They still believe in male leadership. But it's a complementary leadership where we're equal in being but not equal in status. So differences of men and women lead to that kind of male leadership. Men make better leaders. God has designed them to be better leaders. Um, headship, biblical metaphor using head, biblical metaphor for headship always means authority in this view. And so, 20th century, most recent, late 20th century, in fact. Now, on the other side of the chart, <clears throat> radical equality, radical feminism. Radical feminism, by the way, really should translate to matriarchy. I mean, if you want to 
put patriarchy with a complement on the other side, it'd be matriarchy. Uh, so there is a radical feminist group that believes, or position, movement, that believes that women are superior to men. I, I heard a comment recently that uh, studies have been done on corporations where women have been brought into leadership roles in the corporations, and in every case, the corporation's uh, uh, productivity model, the work environment model, improves when you bring women onto the board of the corporation. That, has, that statement, whether it's true or not, that statement has kind of a tinge of women make things work better. <laughs> okay. In a more radical sense, it's men have had their time of authority, now it's time for women to have authority. We want that. It's a very much a personal power and authority and right kind of thing when you move to the more radical extreme. It doesn't deny gender differences. Rather, it exploits them. I don't want to be like a man, because women are better. So it exploits the sense of gender difference, just as radical patriarchy did on the other side. Uh, there is also a movement off to the left, uh, non-traditional, liberal, or, and or secular, of radical equality, where the differences between men and women are minimized, almost erased. And so if you don't particularly like the gender you were born with, surgery can fix that. A little hormone treatment, and it'll all be different. Uh, where, where gender differences are not celebrated, and they're not exploited, they're minimized and almost erased. Very different movements, although they are together sort of off to the left side of this thing. We shouldn't confuse one with the other. Sometimes we think of radical feminism being sort of a radical equality, and, and the terms get used interchangeably sometimes. But for the sake of our class, I want us to understand the difference. So in the center column again, <clears throat> let's take the left side of the center column. Uh, these are together evangelical, okay? Non-traditional, they're not like the old on either side. Non-traditional, but complementary equality. Uh, <clears throat> It was, there was some uh, controversy within our group when we uh, settled on the subtitle for discovering biblical equality. Complementarity without hierarchy. Several persons that we contact, there was a group of three editors, uh, Rebecca Groteis, it's pronounced Groteis, by the way, not Grutheus, but Groteis, Rebecca and Gordon Fee, uh, wanted to uh, incorporate as many voices as we could. Uh, and we also, of course, wanted to make it clear that we were not over in one of these two categories. That we had, especially this one, that we were not about, in the purpose of writing our book, we were not about erasing gender differences or minimizing gender differences. That the argument had been made many times over. You may have heard that argument even in your own studies on this. So to clarify that, right up front on the cover, we put complementarity without hierarchy. Uh, at least three, maybe four contributors that I had really hoped to have as part of our book said they could not write an article for a book that had the C word on the front, complementarity. <laughs> Uh, because the, the, the term had been ruined somehow in their opinion. <clears throat> I strongly believe in God creating male and female for the sake of beneficial differences. Where, where I tend to walk a slightly different path than my complementarian friends uh, is when we begin to make a list of those differences, which the scripture never does. We make a list of those differences, and then we use those lists to prescribe how each individual ought to be as a male or a female. So here's real womanhood. Here's real manhood. And if you're not living up to the, that list, I think it actually gets to be a bit legalistic. Not li living up to the list, then maybe 
you're not mature in your manhood or womanhood. So I believe in complementarity, but not in a sense of a list that gets used as a prescription to describe how every woman ought to be, or act, or feel. So, complementary equality, equality not in sameness, but equality in the sense of equal opportunities to serve. I, I hesitate to use equal rights, although that's a very popular term in our culture, in our country's history, uh, but equal opportunities to serve one another. I, I don't think the scripture, especially the message of Christ in the New Testament, is about exerting authority over each other. Jesus was against that kind of thing. He spoke very explicitly against that. Uh, but the message of Christ, captured I think in, in Philippians 2, is one of emptying ourselves for the service of others, for serving, for loving, for yielding to one another in love. I think that's the emphasis in Ephesians 5. As the husband sacrifices to the wife, the wife submits to the husband. Uh, there is sacrifice and, and sub submission, yielding in love, mutual submission in the previous verse in that paragraph. So, equal to serve is the catchphrase, and it also happens to be the title of a great book back in the 80s by Gretchen Gabeline Hull. Equal to serve, complementary equality, but equal uh, to serve one another, equal in status or being, and equal in function. So if we're equal in being, then why not be equal in function? if being is the basis for that. Uh, this movement actually is older than the complementarian movement. <clears throat> and that is also a sometimes little known fact. I'll put some other stats, historical stats up in a few minutes. But from the Reformation on, there were significant outspoken women, writers, advocating for gender equality. Uh, Textbooks that still would be useful today were produced in the 19th century, in the, in the 1800s, and then the early part of the 20th century. So there is a myth that the gender equality movement was the result of the 1960s and 70s women's movement in the Western civilization. And so all of this started in the 1970s, and, and not the case. It's been around for a long time. Both of these positions affirm <clears throat> traditional view of inspiration and authority of Scripture. Neither of them is simply going to dismiss the passage, or passages, they don't like. Honest scholars on both sides. And, and I can say this with, with some degree of confidence, because when we're working on DBE, we only have 26 people contributing, only 26, a nightmare for the editor. Uh, but we contacted over 100 scholars, uh, not just from the United States, but from the UK and other places around the world, uh, to, as possible contributors to the book. And we made it very clear that if they were going to be contributing to this book, they had to, they had to do two things. They had to believe in a full equality for men and women in both marriage and ministry. Some, some scholars take a split view on that. Uh, equality in the church, but male headship in the home. So, so we only wanted persons who w believed in equality in both places. Uh, and they had to affirm the full inspiration and authority of scripture. Uh, and, and so as not to argue over the fine nuancing of what that means, we said, in practice, it means you don't dismiss a text because you don't like what it says. You don't say, well, that's, you know, probably not authoritative. Uh, and so, full inspiration and authority of Scripture, I didn't have one person write back and say that would be a problem for me. And the, these are the top 100 scholars in the evangelical community uh, around the world uh, f who argue for an evangelical view in gender equality. Um, equal in status and functions. The differences in, in, a, in a male leadership view or a complementary patriarchy view, uh, the differences lead to an exclusion, 
to a more exclusive male leadership. But in the equality view, the gender equality complementary, the differences acknowledged lead to a shared partnership. And then, now I think this is why the companies did better when they brought women onto the board. Uh, not because they fired all the men on the board and replaced all the men with women on the board, <clears throat> but that men and women came together the way God had created us to do, to come together and to work in partnership. Eve was to be Adam's helper, and I'm convinced that if Eve were in trouble, Adam should help her too. Okay, we'll talk about that. But, but uh, God is our ultimate helper, so I don't, don't think it's about subordination. Uh, but we can help each other. I think church boards would be enriched if men and women worked together on the church board. I think the word of God would be heard more effectively if men and women were preaching in the pulpit. So not, not because I want a feminist position, but because I'm arguing for an equality position, a shared partnership in marriage and ministry. I think marriages do better when husbands and wives contribute with their unique giftings of leadership skills in different areas rather than, uh, than just one. Let, uh, Beatrice, let me have you hold the question until, until the end there, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, headship ignored or minimized in this context. Headship here redefined in context. Let me, let me clarify what I'm saying there. Not redefined by me not redefined by the interpreter, but redefined by the biblical writer. Uh, Michelle Lee Barnwall, who teaches here in the Biblical Studies Department, wrote an excellent article, she's complementarian, wrote an excellent article on Ephesians 5, in which she suggests, and I'm just quoting the title of it here, that Paul is standing head on its head in Ephesians 5 that Paul is taking the traditional notions of headship in the Roman society and turning them upside down in Christ. In the Roman society, the husband was the ruler over the wife, the authority over the wife. Paul is saying, husbands, sacrifice your lives for your wife. Love your wives. So, redefinition of headship the traditional notions in this world of power and authority into a servant model. Um, only two places, by the way, that are referenced uh, or, or that incorporate the terminology of headship in all of the gender passages. One in the Ephesians 5 passage where the husband is the head of the wife and one in the 1 Corinthians 11 passage. And we'll talk more about those as we come to them. But uh, the question of what it means, how it is defined in the context, how the Apostle Paul in both cases is using it in the context. Okay, uh, I've given you some definitions. We're going to talk about these in the second half, so I'll just alert you to them. Uh, I think we've pretty well defined them as we've gone along. Uh, I'm still looking for a standard dictionary definition for complementarian or complementarianism. Uh, just, just to point out the fact that the movement is so new that it hasn't made it into the dictionaries yet, except for, of course, Wikipedia, which your movement only has to be a day old to make it there. No offense to Wikipedia, it's very useful. Uh, but uh, in, in the standard printed dictionaries, the, the, uh, even some of the online dictionaries, the Oxford Dictionary, for example, online, which gets updated on a regular basis, the term complementarian doesn't appear yet in the dictionary. Um, and so I have, I've given a definition of it, but I'm just acknowledging that I can't pull it from a standard dictionary because it's just not there. Complementarity or complementar, excuse me, complementary or complementarity, those do occur in the dictionaries, but combining in such a way as to enhance or emphasize each other's qualities, a culture based on these qualities regarding men and women, of enhancing each other's qualities. That's all we have so far as a standard definition for that. Uh, if the complementarian movement 
persists for a long period of time, then of course its views will come into the standard dictionaries. And, and I would expect that would happen fairly soon. The others, the others we have talked about. Uh, a word about the tone of our class. I've mentioned this in just little bits and pieces, but let me now bring it together for you. Uh, three different ways to talk about the evangelical gender debate or to participate in the evangelical gender debate. Uh, one, confrontation. Here's where the biblical prophet comes in. Picture Elijah here confronting the prophets of Baal. Common ground is minimized. What common ground does Elijah have with the prophets of Baal? No compromise. His language is condemning and polarizing, mocking, matter of fact, in the Prophets of Baal story. And there's, there's a loss of hope for reconciliation. That they're not having a dialogue in that context. Uh, there are several examples, uh, and, and I've put this little article online. I, I did just a short article for Catalyst. Uh, Catalyst Online. It's available on Blackboard. You can just click and go to it without having to look it up. But <clears throat> watch for it in the readings that we do. The kind of confrontational language. The kind that tends to push us apart rather than bring us together. Uh, I'm going to encourage you strongly in this class to employ the kind of language that brings us together into dialogue. Maybe not into a consensus. You know, I, I, that won't happen, I can pretty much promise. But at least into a, a warm, friendly, productive dialogue, mutually productive dialogue. Debate acknowledges common ground. Yes, we have all these things in common, but, and then the but comes across a little bit louder than the, all these things. Uh, it intends, and this is pretty evident up front, it intends to change the other person's mind. Y you can tell this when you're just chatting over lunch with somebody. Uh, wh whether you're just having a dialogue, talking about learning from each other, or suddenly you get the impression that they really want you to think differently about this. And they're not going to let go until you do think differently about this. Debate. Center possible way of engaging in this. Aristotle's three principles here come to play. Reason, pathos, and credibility. And you're going to see these. Watch for them in the readings that you do for the class. Uh, of course, reasoning it out. Does their argument make sense? Uh, are they passionate about it? Sometimes passion can almost overwhelm reason. You pound the pulpit heavier if your point's not as important as clear, uh, and credibility. You know, the argument sounds pretty good, but did you know what that person did? You know what their marriage is like? Credibility. All three things come together in a powerful debate format, extended debate especially. We will be doing this in the class. We even have debates scheduled. Uh, but we'll be doing it a little bit ad hoc, off and on, as we go through the semester. And that's fine. Feel free to debate. Now, if the debate continues to go on like a, like a uh, pit bull hanging on to the pant leg and never letting go, then I may call time and say, okay, we really disagree on that, don't we? Okay, let's move on to another subject. <laughs> so if it's just back and forth and back and forth. But the, the engagement, the sort of joiner and rejoiner is entirely appropriate. And feel free to do it with passion. And, and pay attention to credibility, but make sure you have a good logical reason to go with it. Okay, then dialogue. And, and this I've come to appreciate, I, I've come to enjoy so much in, in my journey since 1976, 77, when the year I started teaching here is when I really started getting interested in the gender debate. So at the beginning of the modern wave. So interactive and relational. I have a couple dialogue partners uh, on our faculty here in the Bible department that I really especially enjoy uh, talking with about this. Uh, uh, since I've already mentioned Michelle Lee Barnwall's uh, name, 
Uh, let me just reference the, she and I have team taught this class together as a complementary and egalitarian respectively. Uh, but more importantly, for me at least, we have had wonderful times of just occasional dialogue in the office. Just drop in, say, did you see Alan Padgett's new book that just came out uh, on As Christ Serves the Church? <clears throat> what do you think about that? Uh, and so it's, it's relational. Uh, our relationship is, is as important as our arguments. And we, we, we don't sacrifice relationship for the sake of winning an argument. Uh, it's conversation over lunch often, listening and emphasizing common ground, not just acknowledging common ground, but emphasizing common ground. Uh, not being afraid to say to the person who disagrees with you, you know, you have a good point there. And, and that point doesn't necessarily help my case, but that's a really good point. <laughs> And I need to acknowledge that. Matter of fact, her article on the meaning of head in Ephesians 5 has completely changed the way I look at that passage. It was very influential. Clint Arnold, our new dean that we're going to be installing tomorrow in Sutherland Hall, the new dean of Talbot, also did some work on the meaning of headship and, and the use of kephale, the Greek word for head. Uh, and he has also had a tremendous influence in the way I think about this. Both of them complementarians. So listening, not just listening to see what you, know, you can say back as soon as they stop to breathe, but really learning from what they have to say, thinking about it, pausing, and then responding and interacting. Co-creation of new ideas and paths forward. Because we share common ground, are there things we can do together? Uh, how should we be addressing the, the horrific problem of sex trafficking that goes on today as complementarians and egalitarians together? Is it possible? Are there obstacles to it? Obstacles to it. Uh, how can we sit down and dialogue on those and see a way that we could bring something that we both agree is horrible, bring it more to an end? So mutual empowerment in the context of a healthy tension of autonomy and connectedness. Uh, I, I have to uh, reference ahead of time for you the article at the end of uh, Discovering Biblical Equality by Alice Matthews. I think it's one of the best articles that deals with this uh, tension of autonomy and connectedness uh, that, that we have with regard to the evangelical gender debate. But don't be afraid to empower the other person. If they have something important to contribute, well, you know, I've already pointed you to Michelle Lee Barnwall uh, that has empowered her to a certain degree as an important person of reference. And you, you may want to drop her an email and say, can two or three of us from Ron Pierce's gender class drop by and interview you on Ephesians 5, or maybe on the issue in general. She is currently writing a book on the subject, a full book on uh, the <clears throat> a complementarian position. I don't know what the title will be to it yet, but starting with Genesis and working through the key passages. Uh, and so she is an important resource. We should empower those important resources, bring their voices into our dialogue as much as we possibly can and seek to speak into theirs. So, okay, I think what we're gonna do here, it's uh, just about 10 minutes till three, is I'm, I'm going to, you have this also in the uh, PowerPoint slides that I've uh, put online for you, but I just wanna highlight one or two things on here uh, to bring us up to where we are in the current debate, and we'll stop in about, at about three o'clock here for our break. Uh, Reformation on, mentioned it before, Couple key names, just put them there so we can see a couple of the women who were significant uh, spokespersons for the movement in those days. Uh, in, in the first chapter of Discovering Biblical Equality, there is a history of women in the church going all the way back to the apostolic period and up through the present time by two different authors. One, a church historian, Ruth Tucker, uh, and uh, the um, 
I'm blanking on the second one's name, so I won't try it. Uh, but uh, first major contributions by full books, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, The Vindication of the Rights of Women. And then especially down here in 1873, Thomas Webster's, this is available on the Gutenberg website, by the way, you can download the full text of this book for free. Uh, woman, man's equal. If, if you read that text over a hundred years old now, it sounds like it was written in the context <clears throat> of the contemporary gender debate. Uh, uh, and then uh, Leanna Starr, maybe one of the most important, uh, this is a, a pastor writing, a, a, a well-learned pastor, but uh, this is a, a, a doctor of theology, Leanna Starr, in 1926. A uh, professor of theology with a PhD was unusual. Uh, the Bible status of women, which he examines each of the passages in, in tedious detail. So, so there has been contributions throughout the years to this. Uh, the, the movement is intertwined with the uh, issues of racial equality. Uh, matter of fact, how many of you saw Lincoln just recently? Uh, there was a line in there that was especially interesting for this class. It was when, when the uh, Congress was debating whether or not to grant freedom to the slaves. Uh, the question arose, what will they want next if we give them that? They want to vote? And then what? Women? Are we gonna, uh, is this going to actually extend to women? Okay, 13th and 15th Amendment compared to the 27th Amendment, 19th Amendment, right to vote, 27th Amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, and so the racial issue was dealt with earlier uh, than the gender issue in this context. So uh, vice presidential and presidential candidates, no, not major parties, no, it wasn't Hillary, uh, but presidential and vice presidential candidates uh, throughout this time, or major organizations, National Organization for Women, Evangelical Women's Caucus, and uh, the Council on Biblical Men and Womanhood, and the Christians for Biblical Equality, national organizations, and some landmark meetings. Uh, the 1984 Oak Brook Colloquium was the first gathering of evangelical egalitarian scholars, produced a short book on the subject, with about 10 or 15 contributors to it, was sort of the standard collection of articles up until DBE came out in 2005. So, and then the infamous Evangelical Theological Society meeting in Atlanta, Georgia in 1986. I'll never forget that. I was sitting by a student, Clint Arnold, uh, in the auditorium that evening, a Saturday evening for the plenary session, when Gilbert Bilizikian from Wheaton <clears throat> and a young theological student named Wayne Grudem, yeah, he was a professor at that time, just barely started, had a four-hour debate on gender equality. It started at seven on Saturday evening. Now, I know y'all in the dorm, this isn't a problem, but, but at our age, <clears throat> Uh, going to 11 o'clock in debate format with about a 10 minute stretch break in the middle of four hours was grueling and they weren't finished when it was over. The, the modern era, the modern version of the evangelical gender debate had erupted that Saturday evening in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was no surprise the two organizations followed uh, the next day. What about Biola? Um, We'll uh, finish it up with this. Where have we been as, as an organization? Uh, founded, of course, in 1908 as the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. At that time, I have some pictures here for, uh, for reference. No gender-based restrictions to teach and learn. Women were not only fully welcome in the classes, but we had women Bible teachers in the early days of the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, sometimes an unknown fact. But if you look in the archives, it's there. So Anna, Anna Dennis, and then of course Anna Horton uh, from uh, T.D. Horton, the, uh, uh, one of the founding deans of the school. Uh, we started out as a fundamentalist school, 1908, came to be an evangelical school when that language 
was more prominent in 1949, same year we founded ourselves as a uh, college. Uh, then Talbot uh, Seminary, now Talbot School of Theology. <clears throat> Talbot Seminary begins in 1952, became a university, uh, incorporating all of that in 1981, and then uh, we changed the seminary to a school of theology in 1983, so brief history of Biola's growth. <clears throat> but in that context, women teach and learn at the beginning without restriction, but somewhere along the way, probably post-World War II, the best the historians can analyze this trend, women were less and less permitted to teach in the area of Bible and theology. There, there, there was a backlash, so to speak, a backing off uh, as the men came back from the war. I put two dates on the board, 1975, 1977. Uh, until then, Talbot was established in 52, but until 75 and 77, women were not allowed to study in the Master of Divinity or Master of Theology programs at Talbot. Not, not about teaching, just about learning. And so in 75, 77, we opened up the opportunity for women to become students in those programs. But after 25 years, so a slow process of working through these issues. <coughs> Greater tolerance of the differing views continued in the 70s until the mid to late 80s. Uh, no public gender dialogue, debate dialogue, sort of presenting both sides of the issue, really took place after 1986. There was a, a uh, major chapel presentation series in the gym that time, until this past semester uh, when Kevin Giles and Fred Sanders, some of you may have seen the advertisement for that or even been there, uh, discussed the nature of the Trinity as it related to the gender debate. Uh, and, and that was a very nice time. Matter of fact, it was a debate slash dialogue. And, and I was incredibly pleased at the way it went the tone, the rhetoric, the attitude of the two persons contributing, uh, Fred Sanders from our Tory Honors Program, Kevin Giles, a rector with the uh, church in, uh, in Sydney, Australia, uh, who happened to be in town, uh, and also a, a scholar on church history and dealing with uh, Trinity issues. So women teach and learn in all programs since uh, 1999, Michelle Lee Barnwall here, the first woman to be hired full-time in the Bible department in the modern era. Uh, but no egalitarians uh, have been hired at Talbot for several decades. So Talbot is still primarily a complementarian school. Uh, I, I teach within Talbot, to be clear. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, I'm, I'm the only egalitarian uh, the, within the uh, Talbot faculty, at least the, that is full-time and is outspoken about the issue. About 60 faculty, I think, 60, 65 faculty at Talbot. Uh, most recently, a Biola University gender climate study was done, 1908, or 2008, sorry, on the 100th anniversary. <clears throat> Two thirds of our campus is complementarian, and one third of our campus is egalitarian. This is surveying faculty and students, a uh, broad survey, but this, I think the stats hold also for faculty campus-wide, not, not just within school theology, but campus-wide. So to give a kind of a perspective of where we've come, we've had our own journey uh, as a school on this issue. We've had our own journey in modern history on the issue, intermixed with uh, civil rights concerns uh, and women's suffrage movements uh, of the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And then up, it brings us to where we're at today, and it also, I think it provides us with an important context and backdrop for where we are today. So, so that we don't think this is some new kind of thing that just splashed up a few years ago and will blow, blow over and go away real, real quick. Uh, but this is something that's been going on for, for centuries. Uh, and we are part of the latest discussion, the latest dialogue and debate on that. 
Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.